Welcome into the Archive Sports Business Podcast. This is episode 14. In this episode, we're going to bore you a bit with pick bonds and other instruments used in buying sports teams and leagues, etc. Enjoy. We've talked before a bit, you know, throughout several podcasts and on some of the financial instruments and structures videos that we have on on our YouTube channel, Art Gibbs. We have some financial instruments, financial structures videos there. We talk about pick bonds. We talk about tracking stocks, things like that. And I wanted to kind of just take the opportunity here in this episode to focus only on some of those instruments and explain them a little bit more. They're not too technical, but I just want to be very clear about what they are and give some examples of how they're used. And then we can move on from there. I just wanted to hit hit a reset to some degree and focus specifically on some of these instruments, talk about them, talk about what they are, and, you know, give some examples of how they're used. And it's something that, you know, I had an old history teacher in high school, Mr. Snow, who used to say, "Class, why are we learning about this? Why are we learning about that? Why are we learning that the Battle of Hastings is in 1066? He would always say, quote, it's to be smarter than the average bear. And I think in this sense, some of this stuff, you know, people may use in business, may use in life, or you may just use at a cocktail party. You know, you arrive late, you don't know anybody, you can grab the nearest person and say, you know, hey, do you know what a pick bond is? And boom, you are you got a conversation starter. And before you know it, it's probably time to leave the party and you made it through. You know, you have some cheese. You ask about pick bonds. It's a good, it's a good move. You know, nobody's got an interesting watch. You can do that. So there's many ways to use it. And we've brushed on them and we've, we've mentioned them in previous episodes. We've mentioned, you know, I think namely in the Formula One, Malone's purchase of Formula One, we we spent some time talking about, uh, We I don't know if we named them specifically, but we, we effectively talked about pick bonds and we talked about, we certainly talked about tracking stocks. So again, I just wanted to kind of reiterate the definitions here and then, and they're very simple, uh, but kind of reiterate the definitions and then give some examples of how they're used Briefly, you know, we'll give some examples on how they're used outside of sports, but then additionally, we'll give some examples of how they're used in sports and potentially in charity. Um, the sponsorship in kind, not the pay- not the payment in kind, bonds, the pick bonds, not those, but the sponsorship in kind, you know, is used a lot in charities and things like that. And, you know, charities many times kind of circle into sport or kind of piggybacking on certain sporting events. So, there could be some value there. So here we go. So pick bonds, also known as payment in kind bonds, mean that, you know, in a traditional bond, you buy the bond, the bond pays interest. It pays some amount of cash. Say you buy it in US dollars, you buy the bond, it pays it pays its interest in cash. Or you have a, you know, you buy a, a bond in euros, a euro bond, and it pays it in euros. Um, it's you know, in, in investing in stocks, it's effectively a loan to the company. You're kind of first in line to be repaid if something goes wrong. You know, you sit you sit above common stock. So you've got, you know, if a company were to go bankrupt, you as a bondholder have a claim on those assets that are that are at that company. Whereas, you know, the common stock holders could, you know, a a, a plethora of different scenarios have a claim on on some of the assets of the company and may litigate to have a claim on some of the assets of the company, et cetera, but they do sit lower than the bonds. So the bonds will sort of pick over the rubble first. And that's kind of a dark example, but, but that's, that's why they're sort of considered safer. And generally, you know, bonds have ratings. There's triple A, double A, et cetera, depending on which rating agency you're using, you know, S&P or Moody's, you know, they have kind of a different rating system, but they effectively, they, they correlate. They're, they're basically, you have very credit worthy, somewhat credit worthy and junk and, you know, some, some levels in between there. And obviously junk would be considered the highest risk. 
and it would yield the highest amount. It would pay the most amount. So say you, you know, you had a bond in General Motors, you know, you might, again, dependent on timing, situation, everything, you might get something like 5% or, you know, something like that. And when you buy a, a bond in a, in a company that's, that's lesser, that's, you know, that's seen to have, you know, as having more risk, you might get a higher percentage. You might get 8, 10, 12, 14%. Again, that's totally varies. It varies on interest rates. It varies on a lot of things. Previously, and I'm, I'm not a bond expert. I don't follow that market closely, but we are at least, say, a few years ago, we were in a situation where generally bond yields were lower than traditionally and high yield bonds especially were not sort of yielding a huge amount and then there's a question of, you know, for the people that do follow it closely, is this too high risk for what I'm getting, et cetera? Or are there underlying assets that I could get at? You know, it's it's a, you know, it's a whole, you know, area of expertise. But but generally, you know, without going too much into that, bonds uh, yield a certain amount of money. And they pay that money in cash. And they pay it maybe quarterly or maybe semi-annually or annually or, again, it varies. But the bond is paid it pays an interest rate, just like a common stock may pay a dividend. You know, you own Coke, Coca-Cola, you might get a 3% dividend. And Coke also has bonds outstanding, and you might get 4 or 5% on the bonds. And, you know, maybe 3% on the stock. It's not, it's not, one is not fixed to the other. But generally, you know, you're going to have a slightly higher yield on, on the bonds than on the, the common stock. And the common stock, you obviously have you're exposed to the appreciation of the company value you're exposed to any retained earnings being compounded over time likewise you're exposed to any downside more openly and that's kind of where bonds sit bonds sort of have that more limited upside but you're first to pick over the rubble if something goes wrong so it's sort of considered safer it's it's obviously generally it's a more steady payment that kind of thing and they act differently, and, and we're not going to go too into that unless that's something that people want to go into because it is kind of, you know, it's it's sort of, there's a whole, you know, macro discussion, macroeconomic discussion. There's a whole discussion of how they generally and historically relate to common stocks, how they relate to other uh, countries' bonds generally, how they relate to treasuries, how they relate to uh, LIBOR interest rates, all of that kind of stuff goes into it. Probably if, you know, if somebody decides to vacation in Morocco instead of uh, Paris, it probably affects bond prices. I mean, there's there's a lot that affects it, and there's a lot to study, and it is very fascinating. But we're not going to get too far into that. And you know, there's there's a lot of um, yeah, we're not going to get too far into that. But there's there's a lot there. So hopefully that's not confusing. Anyway, so the you know you've got the common stock which is effectively the equity in the company. You own the company. You're exposed to the company upside. And the the bonds are kind of the debt of the company. So let's talk about pick bonds now that we kind of have that base set up. So pick bonds, payment in kind bonds, are actually paid, the interest is paid in more bonds. So i.e. the interest is paid in a form of growing debt. So if you you have a a company and you uh, issue a bond, you maybe you issue $100 million worth of bonds and they're pick bonds for some amount of time. And usually it's a, usually with these, it's only for a certain amount of time. And then it's either on the lender's discretion or the, the borrower's discretion. Usually there's kind of a toggle back to some level of cash at some point or some offer to purchase some of those bonds back. But anyway, so basically you're, you're paying for the interest in those bonds. You're paying with more bonds. So you're growing your debt level in proportion and as related to your interest. So you've got $100 million in bonds. You might offer 10% on that on that bond. And instead of paying that out in cash, you're, you're, you pay it out in more bonds and you grow that debt level. Now, obviously, you can see that that's kind of out there. That's kind of a higher risk, higher leverage thing. You know, you're as time goes on, you're increasing your debt to to somebody or to some group of people. And that's true. You know, it's not as bad as, you know, angel investing or something where you, you get 
literally, I, I think that's why they call it angel investing. You get you 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 give twenty thousand dollars and you get a wing and a prayer from the uh, the the twenty one year old founder. But no, I'm kidding. But you know, it's it's uh, um, it's not that bad usually. But uh, and and not that that's bad. But it's not. But it, but again, it's not that you don't have that upside and that downside and that that risk necessarily. But it does sit high on the debt mosaic. So you're going to pay a higher interest rate, and it's usually considered a pretty risky transaction. Now, to talk a little bit about how they were used and how they were popularized and that kind of stuff, and again, we did mention in the Formula One, uh, the purchase of Formula One by John Malone and Liberty Media, in that purchase, uh, they did use pick bonds, they did use tracking stocks. But really, where this came about and where this was popularized, and many of you have probably heard about this, is in leveraged buyouts in the in the 1980s. You know, these, whatever, I don't want to say it, but you know, these like drug-fueled 1980s, uh, you know, Wall Street situations. The, there were leveraged buyouts. And the leveraged buyouts, you know, are exactly what they sound like. And we'll talk very quickly about how a leveraged buyout set up. Again, it's very simple, but just kind of to to frame it up, we'll talk about how a leveraged buyout is, is set up. But these were popularized in that time when these companies, these these corporate raiders, the people taking over the companies, the the management groups, the private equity groups, all of these people that were going to do these these take private transactions, basically these leveraged buyout, take private transactions. All these companies that were going to do that, they were looking for more and more debt. And that's where the whole Michael Milken, junk bond uh, kind of situation came about, where people were looking for these high-yield bonds. There was, a big, there was a big market for them, and it was easy, it, it was relatively easy to raise a large amount of money and pay a lot for that money. Now, of course, you pay a lot for the high yield. You have to come up with that money. Uh, continuously, obviously. So to manage these high levels of leverage in a lot of these corporate uh, takeovers, some of the more sophisticated corporate takeover people, and we're going to talk about KKR, which is still going on today, and is considered, I guess, cutting edge in finance, potentially. Maybe that's a way to put it. I don't know. They envy Buffett's setup, but they have a pretty good setup and they usually do a lot of interesting things. And usually if there's some financial instrument or product out there, they will be they will have used it or be one of the early ones to use it if, if they're they see some value in it. But they in their bid for RJR Nabisco, which is that whole transaction is amazingly, you know, depicted in the in the book Barbarians at the Gate. It's a fantastic read if you haven't read it. But in that, KKR came up with, you know, in their proposal, they had pick bonds, payment in kind bonds. So how, why and how is that important, or why? Well, how does that work? So let, let's talk real quickly about that. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk real quickly here about leverage buyouts and how they work, and these kind of going private transactions. And we will refrain in this discussion from talking about uh, some of the anti-corporate takeover measures that were implemented following this this period. We'll we'll save those for a later date. So things like the poison pill and that kind of stuff we're going to save for a later date in a later episode. So come back for that if you if you have interest in hearing about how that came about and how that works. But let's just talk about the basics of how a corporate takeover or a, a leveraged buyout happens. Again, many of you will know this, but just to kind of briefly discuss it, uh, the common stock, as we mentioned early in the episode, represents the company. Basically, it's the equity of the company. It is the company. Now, that common stock, you can you can have debt. You can have other things involved that can make that common stock worthless or the company can run losses or whatever, but the common stock represents the company. So the the market capitalization, the cumulative value of all of that common stock is the value of the company. And if you own the common stock, you you own the cash, you own the factories, you own the IP, 
you know, the intellectual property that the company owns, all that stuff. You, you, you are the company, basically. Now, that company could have huge amounts of debt, and that debt claim, if something were to go wrong or it were, you know, you were to go bankrupt or the company were to go bankrupt, you know, that those bonds would have a claim, you know, prior to that common stock. But again, that common stock represents the company. So purchasing all of that common stock represents owning the company. So let's use a, an example. Let's say you've got Mystery Company X. And Mr. Mystery Company X produces in profit, let's say, $100 million a year. And for some reason, you as an investor or a private equity person or whatever, feel that the stock has somehow gotten undervalued. So maybe the company produces $100 million a year, and the stock on the open market is trading at $300 million total market capitalization. And maybe they have no debt, you know, and and they have some cash on the balance sheet. Or maybe they have a little bit of debt, say $10 million in debt and $10 million in cash on the balance sheet. So we'll kind of wash that out in the calculation, you know, give or take. And so there's this company that produces $100 million a year that's that's trading at, you know, $300 million. Well, you could buy the stock, you know, you could buy some of the stock as an investor and you know, you would you would be exposed to this company that you feel is very cheap. And if you feel that it can produce hundred million dollars a year going forward, or maybe even grow that going forward or something like that, then that may be a very good company to buy. Um, but if you were to purchase all of it, you could control the company. So you could sell off a factory if you didn't like it, or you could cease production at a factory, or you could increase production at a factory, or you could buy another company if you wanted, or you could issue a special dividend, or you could issue a regular dividend going forward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You could lease out certain assets. You know, you you would control the company. And if you felt that there was some real value there, you might go ahead and and um, potentially make an offer for the company. Now, the way that offer is made, and, and again, we're going to kind of tiptoe around the hostility angle a bit. So we're going to sort of tiptoe around the fact that potentially the board and management would not want you to buy the stock. Let's just say that it's generally a harmonious situation. The the board, you know, wants to accept your tender offer and they recommend it to shareholders in a shareholder vote. So let's just say everything is harmonious. So in that situation, when everything's harmonious, you know, you, maybe the stock's trading at $300 million, you're going to have to offer more, you know, to get people to sell the stock to you. Maybe you offer $350 million. Let's just say you maybe even you offer $400 million for the, for all of the stock. Now, where do you get the money? How do you get the money? You know, to pay $400 million is a lot. Now, if this company's producing $100 million, producing a lot of money, you can borrow the money by issuing these bonds. You can you know, raise the money. You could borrow it if it's a smaller transaction. You could borrow it from a bank or you could borrow it from a syndicate of banks or you could do some degrees of bond offerings. And if you do the bond offerings and you, you raise the money through these bond offerings, that's a way to get the money. So you might say, well, I've got $50 million or $100 million in my private equity group We're going to buy this company for $400 million. We're going to finance the $300 million. We're going to have, you know, whatever the number is, you know, $20 million a year or something in interest payments. And we're going to make $100 million a year. We're going to have this $80 million a year gap. You know, we're going to make, you know, again, just to basically simplify it, like saying that you don't touch the company and the earnings remain the same. You know, you're going to make $80 million a year. Uh, from your investment of $100 million. And you could theoretically give yourself a special dividend the first year of $80 million or $60 million or something and and cash yourself out or partially cash yourself out and, and really begin to cash yourself out pretty quickly. You could, in a couple of years, ha- have the company for free effectively. Now, again, that's the perfect scenario, the simplest scenario, et cetera. But that's what was happening at breakneck pace in the 80s. Now, what made the 80s a little bit different and what made some of these leveraged buyouts a little bit different and why the 
the pick bonds really came to the forefront is that these companies were not currently producing $100 million a year. They were maybe producing $10 or $20 million a year, but they had a large amount of assets or they had some cash on the balance sheet or they had too many employees it w- would be the view you know maybe you know cut the the workforce which is not great but you know that that may be what was what was viewed by the by the takeover uh, could be uh, yeah again divesting a subsidiary divesting a factory halting production moving production abroad etc cetera, etc cetera, where they felt that hey when we come in we can buy this company you know it's undervalued we think it's undervalued we sell this division And then we sort of cash ourselves out by selling this division versus cash ourselves out by paying a special dividend. And either of which you can't really force to be done if you don't own the whole company. And you can't, you you certainly can't do it at your discretion if you don't own the whole or the vast majority of the company. So, you know, just as a public shareholder, if if someone was running sort of a, you know, a hedge fund or something and they said, hey, I want to, you know, I I do think that this company has value. I want to invest $5 million dollars. You know, you you can't force. Well, you can, but you you would have to sort of do it through activist investing and do it through the traditional channels and try to get on the ballot uh, your proposal to you know and, and get management to accept it or have discussions with management or or go to a proxy fight and get your proposal on a on a ballot. You would you would have to work with management or work through management, et cetera, to try to get that done and try to convince them that it has good value. And one of the issues in the 80s and, and still to some degree to this day is the is the gap between, you know, the, this this idea that you've got, and we'll kind of just go into this real quick, and one of the reasons that you have these hostile takeovers and that you have activist investing and all of this kind of stuff is that you've got um and there's a great there's a great cinematic uh, whatever of this in Wall Street, the original Wall Street movie by Oliver Stone from the 80s, where they talk about Teldar Paper, this fictional company. And they talk about the board of directors and all the management people and all together they own, you know, half a percent of stock. And many times that's true. So many times, um, and I'm not, again, I'm not speaking about any company specifically, and I'm not speaking about this area, this era versus another era or anything like that. I'm not making any claims in that way. I'm just saying that many times the CEO and the CFO and all of these people all together and the board members all together do not own a lot of the stock. Now, that's certainly not always the case. That's almost never the case with a founder. And it's it's nothing to sort of just get upset about on the surface, but it is it is a truism that many times, you know, the board is paid some amount of money, you know, hundred grand, two hundred grand, three hundred grand, whatever to come to a few meetings. The CEOs generally get paid well, and if they're doing a great job, that's great. And you've got your managements, and they're generally paid well, and if you're doing a great job, that's great. And you know, but generally they don't own a lot of the stock unless it's a really small company or they're a founder or they're, you know, in a lot of cases. And even, you know, even the stock a lot of times that they do own is given, you know, as incentives. So many times they don't have capital tied up in the stock that that there's sort of an opportunity cost for. Like, hey, they could have this capital somewhere else or this capital somewhere else. You know, the so it's sort of the idea is they they buy a beach home and you know S and P five hundred tracking ETFs and you know not their own company stock you know and again there's nothing wrong with that and you can invest how you want but that's sort of the cynical view is that you have this multi million dollar salary and you're buying in these other areas with your capital and you're only you know potentially accumulating stock by options etc and and again there's nothing wrong with that but the idea is that sometimes investors can feel that you are not uh, sort of acting in their best interest as shareholders, as shareholders who have capital tied up that need to get a return. Now, not every shareholder is good-hearted and all this kind of stuff. There's no doubt about that, and I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that many CEOs don't do a fantastic job for the shareholders. But that's where a lot of this issue and questions of hostility, you know, and I mean hostility in terms of a hostile takeover. I don't mean literal you know, hostility. I mean, hostility in terms of it, hostile takeover is basically just called when, you know, the board and management uh, 
you know, do not want to accept your offer. You know, they don't want to put, they're not going to recommend it in a, in a proxy vote there, you know, which is your shareholder vote. They're not going to recommend it. They don't like it. They're going to recommend against it. You know, every each, the large investor in the board is going to hire their law firms to write large papers about why their proposal is amazing for shareholders and, you know, et cetera, right? It's an election. It's, it's literally a vote. Um, and that's where that battle kind of ensues. But that's, that's kind of what sets the stage for some of this stuff and what set the stage for a lot of these hostile takeovers in the 80s was, hey, look, we've got this, this, these bonds out there. We've got this ability to raise this money. And with that money, we can go buy these companies. We can tighten their belts, basically. We can lay people off. We can close factories, which, again, is not great, but that, that's what was happening. And, and you know, they were saying, hey, this creates shareholder value. So that was happening a lot in the 80s. And in RJR and Nabisco's case, this was RJR, this was Reynolds Tobacco. We'll use this as an example. Again, there's a fantastic book that talks about this, but we'll just use it here really briefly to, to talk about the, the pick bonds. So in RJR's case, you know, RJR was RJR Tobacco out of Winston-Salem where they used to have signs that said, thank you for smoking, all of that kind of stuff. And then Nabisco was this uh, cracker company. And at the time, crackers, I know now we've got a lot of keto diets, and, and that's great. They're fantastic. I've done Whole30 myself, but, uh, and, and, and they are great. But, uh, and, you know, the science back then didn't have, and again, I'm not a dietitian, the science back then, crackers was the, the way to health. You know, cereal was the way to health. So Nabisco sort of had this healthy vibe, and, and RJR, you know, tobacco did not. Uh, but there was kind of this situation where that company was merged into one, RJ and Nabisco, and you know the the Reynolds Tobacco, the tobacco business was was still in sort of these this late '80s time was still producing a lot of money, a lot of cash flow. It was a legacy business. It was declining slowly, you know, sort of year over year, but it was producing a lot of money and a lot of cash. And the the cracker company was doing okay, but this was an extremely large company. I think it was like 17 billion by the time it was done, or maybe it was even up to 20 billion by the time all the all the bids were in. But it was that kind of a number in the late 80s. And people thought you could never do this. You could never take this private. You could you could never raise that kind of money. And I won't go into the the story too much. But basically, there was a situation where there was going to be a management led buyout by the by the current CEO uh, who was making good money. That to kind of characterize it, the company was producing some profit, you know, some good profit, but the stock wasn't really going up. And, and the sort of long story short is they, they had a lot of uh, expenses. They had a whole sort of armada of planes, corporate planes. They had, you know, a lot of advertising that they did that they sort of did just to do. And they didn't feel that it made a lot of money. And, you know, maybe they had too many people working and that kind of stuff. And so there was a lot of this sort of talk. And, you know, the management, the CEO, you know, they were kind of like, well, they, they were approached by some some different people that said, hey, you could, you know, you could take this private, you would get a big percentage of it, you'd be the management team. So, you know, the management would, would, would stay the same, basically. Uh, but, you know, you'd have to cut a little bit, you'd have to cut some of these corporate jets and all this stuff to pay the debt that we'd, that we'd have to, you know, raise to, to buy the company. And so that kind of uh, was in the works. And, you know, the procedure was that the CEO and this group would go to the board to present their idea. And when they did, the, the board did not like the amount of compensation that was going to be given and the, the percentage that was going to be given to this, this management team for just being the management team and not putting up their capital. And the fact that 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 was the case and that that got turned down, all of a sudden, all these other suitors started brewing and the sort of the battle ensued. And one of these other suitors, KKR, uh, Kohlberg, Kravis, and Roberts, I believe, Kravis, Kohlberg, and Roberts, some, you know, they were a large private equity uh, group. And they, and actually now they're, they're publicly traded themselves. I don't believe they were at the time. Uh, but they, they were one of these suitors. And they, in their proposal, you know, there's a lot of back and forth, but in their proposal, they had these payment in kind bonds. And at the time that was kind of an odd 
it was it was kind of unique. And they had these payment in kind bonds. And what that would allow them to do is that, and I don't have the specific terms in front of me. It's you can you know it's it's out there to to view, but the basically there was something like they had five years say of runway, where their a portion of their bonds maybe it was a third of it let's say, and again I don't I don't have that pulled up right in front of me but let's say it was a third of the bonds were these payment in kind bonds so they. They'd go raise this money. Maybe they had to raise $10 billion or something. They'd put up the rest in cash or something. Well, let's say they had to raise $12 billion, something like that. And they did have a big war chest, but, you know, still putting up four or five billion is a lot. But, you know, let's say they had to raise, you know, $12 billion. Well, you know, a third of that, so $4 billion, was going to be these these payment in kind bonds. And what that would do, obviously, is is sort of reduce the monthly or the quarterly or the semi-annual cash outlay that would have to happen by KKR as the new owners. And, you know, they were going to do things like sell off certain divisions. I believe they were going to sell off Nabisco, uh, I think, and, you know, let the kind of the cash flow from Reynolds pay for, pay for the debt. And they would pay down a certain amount of the debt that was cash paying debt with, with the divestiture of, of Nabisco. And again, there's a lot of, there's a lot of terms to the deal, but or detail to the deal. But that that's how they were using these payment in kind pick bonds. What was in that was in that type of a situation. So that's that's an example of pick bonds, payment in kind bonds. Um, let's see. So we didn't really get too into tracking stocks here. We'll we will save the tracking stocks for another episode, and we'll find a way to tie it in uh, in another episode. But again, so that's the payment in kind bonds, and we'll we'll also we'll actually move sponsorship in kind, which I was going to get into in this episode. We'll actually move that to a future episode as well. Um, but just to kind of finish up this payment in kind bonds, as we mentioned, this was used in the uh, Formula One transaction where Liberty Media purchased Formula One. In that situation. So, as we mentioned in this Formula One deal, there was $350 million in debt that Formula One could exchange into Liberty shares. There, some of them were new shares, and then some of them were, were issued, some of them were new shares issued, you know, sort of post-purchase and et cetera, but they had an ability, so Formula One had an ability to exchange some percentage of these shares into Liberty Media shares in lieu of getting an interest payment. So this was a type of payment in kind bond. Now this was in, you know, at Formula One's discretion, but this was an example where they had, you know, in purchasing this Formula One group, this large purchase, they had, you know, not all of it was in cash, not all of it was in debt, and not all of it was, you know, et cetera. It was a combination of all of these things. So there was 1.1 billion in cash, as we talked about. There was 138 million of newly issued Liberty Media shares that were that were used. Generally, that's kind of a high cost issuing that equity. And then there was $350 million in debt that Formula One could exchange into Liberty shares, you know, at their discretion. So there's there's that level of that, and that's what a that's what a toggle pike is, is that one party or another party has the ability to toggle uh, a cash payment and then toggle to a payment in more shares. Now, this is not a traditional pick bond in, in the Liberty Media deal because it's it's an exchange for equity versus sort of uh, growing debt. So it's it's a little bit different, but it's but I I kind of wanted to characterize that a little bit. So again, there's this $350 million in debt that can be exchanged into the Liberty Media shares at their discretion. So it's a level, a type of toggle pick in a way. Uh, again, not exactly the same. It's not just growing that debt. It's actually actually issuing equity in lieu of those interest payments. But again, this is the kind of thing that that can happen with the with bonds and with with these bonds specifically. So that's what I wanted to do was was talk a, a little bit about that and you know, like I said, we'll get into sponsorship kind uh, more in detail in a later episode. Again, sponsorship in kind is going to be very similar. You know, it's it's exactly what it sounds like, similar to payment in kind. So you've got your, you know, you're going to sponsor someone, and instead of giving them cash as your 
sort of your sponsorship consideration, you're going to give them some type of service, some type of product, and that will be sort of noted as having some cash value instead. So sort of in lieu of cash, you're going to give give that other, basically that other form. And again, that was mentioned a lot in the the Liberty Media, uh, John Malone Formula One episode, The this idea that you know, there was a question of, of consideration and form. So consideration is basically, you know, amount of payment, what was paid for the, the item or the business or the, or the sponsorship. And then form is, of course, what form. So is it in debt? Is it in newly issued shares? Is it in options to purchase shares? Is it in options to purchase a factory? Is it in cash? Is it in you know, newly issued equity, et cetera. So what is the, what is the form that's used to purchase? That's a, that's another, another consideration. All right. So yeah, like I said, we'll get into sponsorship and kind later. And and that's where there's a big tie into charities and and different things like that. A lot of times they're used and, you know, any, like an event, any, you know, say a cycling event, you could have early charity races. There might be sponsorship and kind in, in so far as someone might offer, you know, bikes or, timing devices or et cetera to have their name up while while the race is going on and that kind of stuff. But we'll we'll get more into that in in the in future episodes. Uh, like I said, so thank you for listening. And and like I said, we do have a another channel, a, a YouTube channel where we where we talk about uh, financial videos and they're sort of real crisp and short. So if you're you know studying for a test or you're you have a quick question about something you can go to art gibbs on youtube and there's there's these videos that have you know we talk about pick bonds toggle picks we talk about synthetic leases we talk about tracking stocks just all of that kind of stuff and again m- most videos are not over 10 minutes they're very quick very to the point and we have a great community there and then of course we'll we'll post this episode on youtube and hopefully you learned something today and you know we kind of got down that pick bond rabbit hole but we'll We'll pick it up and we'll we'll do more uh, more as it's specifically related to sports in the future. But I just figured since we had talked about some of that stuff and some of that financial stuff came up in the Malone episode that I wanted to kind of hit that again more directly and hope you enjoyed. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you.